Yeah. Luke chapter number seven. When you're there, Luke chapter number seven. Let's stand over to reading God's word. I think I'll, I'll be 39 on f f my birthday's Thursday. I'm, I was born on I was born on Good Friday, 1984. I know it's a day that people smoke weed, <laughs> but that's not what I will be doing on my birthday. So with that being said, we're celebrating it on Wednesday, but my birthday's on Thursday, just so you know. And if you're going to post pictures and you don't have updated pictures, I'll be outside after service on sun uh, today to take pictures with you. So you don't post pictures from 1992 or 2008 where I had no facial hair. So I'll be outside giving you updated pictures. All right. Uh, where's Nate? He gone? He on vacation? He ain't tell me. Okay, real cool. He's off? He's online. Okay. It was Nate's wedding anniversary, and I saw him up here singing. I was like, why? Let's let's say happy anniversary to Fab and Nate. They're celebrating their anniversary a couple weeks ago. church survived and you're not here. Thank God. Okay, Luke chapter number 7. By the way, it's at 645 Eastern Standard Time, Wednesday, just in case y'all missed the time. Luke 7, verse number 36. Oh, let me tell you all this too. So when I announced that we're doing a prayer night for my birthday, so I know some of y'all seen this, this, uh, uh, I don't want to say it nice. Um, there was an individual tagging me every single day on social media. Like, just ignore it. Like, nobody's following that person. And if you, if you respond, you give a person attention that doesn't deserve attention. You understand what I'm saying? Like, his page has no one following it, no one commenting on it. So don't, don't give that energy. And they're, they're not mentally there either. So the Bible says if you argue with a fool, you become a fool. You understand what I'm saying? People text me, Pastor, you want me to give them that smoke? No. <laughs> no. Let's reserve our energy for things that matter. State attorney, smoke means nothing what you're thinking about, okay? It just... <laughs> like, it just, like every year there's someone that comes up and, you know, they just, they just, they just, you know, you just got to just stay focused and not let those things derail you. So I just want you all to know that we are aware and um, as long as they don't come here, we're good, right? We're fine. I had one guy that said he's my son-in-law a couple of weeks ago. It's, it's something all the time, so that's why. You just, you know, be prayerful and vigilant. Watch and pray. Have the peace of the Lord, P-E-A-C-E, -E, in your heart and the peace of the Lord. 40 cal preferred, but uh, sometimes 9 millimeter. All right, so with that being said, Luke chapter number 7, verse 36. Hey, is Paul here? Paul, Darius. No? Okay, Paul might be online. I saw him at the mall. He told me he was going to be here. I don't see. He's a photographer. So tag him. Paul, Darius. I'm going to wait till you log on to start preaching. No, I'm just joking. Luke chapter number 7, verse 36, it says, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, back up. When one of the Pharisees, any of y'all see a problem right there? Okay, a Pharisee's inviting Jesus to dinner. 
Isn't it crazy people who don't like you will invite you to eat? He went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. He went to Simon the leper's house. A, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life. So this is where it's kind of unique. Some people think this was not Mary Magdalene. Some people think it was. But this woman was actually a prostitute. She learned Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, and it wasn't uncommon that if a Pharisee was holding a dinner, that people from the streets would just walk in and be a part of it. So don't think about it like America. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Pause, because some of you are like, what in the world are we reading? Okay, when a woman would kiss a person's feet, it wasn't, it, it wasn't um, left. It was, it was a sign of respect. It was a sign of deep endearment. So, so you're aware. So when you're reading it, you understand. Then she wiped them with her hair. Pause. Your hair in that culture was everything. Kind of like today, but even greater. Like your glory was about your hair. Like no one played with your hair in that culture. It, it was a simple, even the Nazarites, they were like, you do not cut your hair. Whatever you do, you let it grow because your hair is a representation of your identity. So imagine she's taking what she's supposed to be known for and wiping his feet with it. So when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. She's a sinner, a prostitute. She gets men to pay her to be with her. Jesus answered him and said, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher. He said, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them have the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt. He said, you've judged correctly. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. Because it was customary, because when they would walk, they would get dirt in their feet. They didn't have sneakers. They wore sandals. So when they would walk through the city, you would get dirt on your feet, and it was customary that when you walk into someone's house, they have someone assigned to wash your feet. But because they didn't respect Jesus, they didn't even think enough to have something that's basic for him. So he says, this woman, now you understand how powerful it is, this woman didn't, did not give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears, and wipe the dirt off my feet with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman did. From the time I entered, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, many sins have been forgiven as her great love has been shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins they're forgiven. You know what this tells us? He, Jesus is basically saying, I can tell you how people love me by how deep their sins have been and how deep they've been forgiven. So a God that has forgiven you a little deserves just okay praise. But a God that has forgiven you much Okay, that's this this side ain't understand. So so a God that has done and forgiven you a little deserves the patty cake. 
but a God that you know you can recall has done some great forgiving for you deserves great praise. Y'all just still playing with them. A great God deserves what? Great praise. Let, let's practice that one more time. A great God deserves what? Let me stop one more time. A great God. No, I didn't say a good God. I said a great God deserves great praise. It ain't got to be anything that I'm feeling like doing. It's I'm going to do it because a great God deserves what? Let's try it one more time. A great God deserves what? One more time. A great God deserves what? All right. A great God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. A great God deserves great praise. I want to call this message today from our subject theme, A House for the Hungry. I want to call this subject this morning, I Got the Check. So, a couple months ago, I had the opportunity to go to lunch with somebody who I thought would add great value. And we went to lunch and we, we were having a conversation about some things that I think are important and valuable. And he was giving me some critique and advice on how to better position um, myself in the business space because he felt like there was effort that I was putting in that wasn't getting the highest return because of the way that my mindset was. And so in order for you to change the way you live, you first got to change the way you think. Because you can't change the way you live with the same way that you think. So the same mindset that got you in that problem is not going to be the same mindset that gets you out of that problem. So because the, the bill came and we had ordered food, and then when the bill came, because of the value that he provided for me, I said, when the waiter came, I got the check. The reason I said I got the check was not that this individual could not pay for himself. It was the simple fact that it was the least I could do for the value that he added to my life. The $150 bill that I paid was minimal to the advice that he gave that would produce tens and hundreds of thousands. So the reality is, is because of the value that this individual gave, we in turn reciprocated by saying, I got the check. Now, it would be detrimental if you went to dinner, lunch, breakfast with someone who provided that level of value for you, and then you look at them and you say, you pay the bill. So in this particular text, we're, we're finding that there's an argument in the text where whether it's Mary Magdalene or whether it's the woman in the streets. But let me just kind of break down who Mary Magdalene was. Last week, we talked about her. She was the main one that came to the grave and she was the financier of Jesus' ministry. But here's something that you need to know about Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was a wealthy woman in a time where women were not always wealthy. Because there are opportunities that God gives all of us to break and defy all the rules. Y'all, women should have said amen, like real loud. Like, she wasn't married. The scriptures don't say anything about her being married. Some believe that she was a woman that had an industrial complex that created wealth and revenue and the town that she was from was Magdala and she was named after the town that her father had started and given her great wealth. Now she's got all this money, she's doing very well for herself. Now in that day you know everybody knows who she is because not a lot of women make money. And so they know Mary Magdala, oh, this is the, this woman, she's it. But for some weird reason, we don't know how, according to the scripture, it says that Jesus healed her 
from the ailment of being oppressed. Now, that's kind of interesting because we really don't know was she demon-possessed or was she mentally oppressed with sickness from a demon? Which gives us two ways to look at things. There's a possibility that some demons can oppress you or take over your body and make you deranged. And then there's also an inclination in the text that there are some sicknesses that are not just sicknesses, they're demonic influences that make you sick. So sometimes it's because we ate all the baby back ribs, but other times it is demonically inflicted so that we can't get better. Whatever the case is, Jesus has the capacity to heal if you're sick internally or if you're sick by possession. So now this woman, she, she comes and she is ill and Jesus does something that her money could not do. Her money could not get her healing. Now, I believe that in every space in our lives, God reserves a spot where only he can do it. Now, think about it in your life. There is one area that you need to be here on Wednesday night at 645 before the Lord to bring. But think about it, for real. There's one area in your life that only God can fix. You know, some of you are acting like you don't know what I'm talking about. There's one area in your life that only God can fix. Like, like money can fix this, resources can fix this, relationships can fix this, but there's one thing that even the doctors don't know what to do. There's one area that even the physicians have said, yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know what to say about that. That you have to give over to God. There's one area in your life that even though you got your master's degree, you got your doctorate degree, or even if you got your PhD, or even if you got your bachelor's degree, there's one area in your life that you still can't win. And Mary was in that spot. She was, she was in the spot where she could not find healing. But then she meets a man that looks at her and says, you're rich in one area and poor in another. See, the problem with this culture and generation is we're striving to be financially rich, not recognizing that we're broke in another area. And so you, you can't appreciate someone making, okay, so, so you don't know how poor you are until you get to someone who's richer than you in that area. So you don't know how relationally poor you are until you get with someone who has a high quality relationship and you recognize, man, my relationship is poor. You don't recognize how financially destitute you are until you get with somebody who has more resources than you and you say, man, I don't. you don't realize how small of a house you live in until you go see another house that's bigger than yours. You don't know how not great your car is until you get with somebody who has a greater car. You don't know how bad your basketball team is until you watch LeBron play and you realize your player's not as good. So the only way you recognize your deficiency is by standing up to someone who's rich where you're poor. Now the challenge with most of us is we only like to hang around people who are poor in the same area we are poor in. You don't realize how limited your prayer life is until you get around someone who actually prays. Right? Until, you know, you should have friends that challenge you financially. You should have friends that challenge you physically. You should have friends that challenge you emotionally. And you should have friends that challenge you spiritually. 
like they may not be all the same person in the same space, but there should be friends in each level of category. But here we go. So now she decides that she needs Jesus. She meets Jesus, and then Jesus heals her. And what does she do when Jesus heals her? She follows him for the rest of her days. She finances everything he needs. Because what is money to someone who turned my entire life around? No, no. What is resources when someone has changed my entire future? So she starts following him. Now, I don't know about this text, if this is Mary Magdalene or if Mary was a prostitute. Some have given her, Mary Magdalene, that theme, and they say it's the wrong theme for her. But whatever the case is, this woman that came to meet Jesus was a prostitute. Everybody knew her. Her reputation preceded her. So now I want to give you some things that are very interesting that you need to be aware of that are in this text. So what happens is, is the Pharisees know that whenever we have a dinner, it's open to the public. So Simon the leper says, you know what, I'm going to invite Jesus to my crib. And all the Pharisees are like, yeah, let's invite him so we can trap him. Because you got to remember, sometimes you're not, you know, some of y'all talking about, I, I, uh, 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 they say like, you know, I'm, I'm pulling up at the table, and then some will say, well, I'm just not going to be treated as a napkin at the table. I am the table and all that. But you also got to recognize, sometimes you're at the table, not because you're one of them, but because they need information to trap you so they can keep you out the table forever. So let me first say this. You need to learn how to discern your table. Because some tables you eat at and some tables you eat and observe what information is being asked because sometimes you're the one that's actually on the menu. I'll catch that later. No, some tables you eat at and you discern and observe what's being discussed because sometimes you're the meal on the table. You know, some people will sit with you to get information about other people and not really want to be with you, but they know the only way to get the information about other people is to sit with you and get that information. Some things they don't want your opinion, they just want your word so they can use it against you later. Jesus is sitting there recognizing the situation. But then here comes a woman out of nowhere. The door swings open and everybody's looking like what's about to happen the, the Pharisees are sitting there saying ooh there go that lady she probably was with Jesus look at her they probably had a relationship together I know it but, but Jesus is sitting there and all of, out of nowhere can you imagine how awkward it is we're eating and this woman just comes out of nowhere and drops to her knees and the awkwardness of a woman that's been known to be for the streets. I wanted to call this message for the streets. But she was for the streets, but she had a revelation. And some revelations don't always come right away. Sometimes God has to allow you to live a certain way so the light bulb can come on so you'll never go that way again. So, so she gets there and she drops to her feet and, and, and she starts crying. The question the text doesn't ask, and I read things very philosophically, I want to ask, why are you crying? Like nothing is happening for you to start crying. Why are you crying? I don't know. But maybe we can suppose she finally found somebody that it wasn't a transaction. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. She, she finally found somebody that actually wanted her presence. At, 
She finally found somebody that wanted to be around her and didn't want something in exchange. You know how it is when someone calls you to go to lunch, they really want something, but really it's not the lunch. You start getting surprised when people call you and just say, man, I just called to check on you. I didn't even need anything, didn't even want anything. Why? Because she knew every time I meet somebody, it's just a transaction. It's never how you're doing. You only ask me how I'm doing so you don't feel bad about asking me what you need from me and she says she starts weeping interrupts the entire dinner because worship is never at the wrong time yeah it's never at the wrong time so she begins to to cry and starts letting her tears fall on his feet. And according to their culture, if an unclean woman like that touched you, you were unclean. But Jesus is trying to teach us some stuff that, you know what, it doesn't matter how dirty you are, just touch me. Now the church won't let you touch them. Do you see how tight her jeans are? Do you see how, I'm not saying that your jeans should be tight. Don't, 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 don't sermon clip it. Talk about that. Why I like that church. Right? No, this, this no. He's, he's simply saying, no, you, you see, you see, Jesus is like, no, you know, the church will tell you, no, we, we don't want you, we don't want you to, no, no, we don't want you to have a relationship with Jesus because you don't fit the look. Now, for some of you that's like, See that why he my pastor. No, but but after a while, your look should start to conform to the image that you're beholding. So now, all of a sudden, she starts touching something that's pure, even though she's not. You know, it takes faith to be able to touch something better than you. You know why most of us can't touch God? Because we let pride make us feel like I shouldn't be touching him. When in actuality, you should be saying, my pride is stopping me from getting better and I need to touch him. I've touched everybody else. I might as well touch somebody who can actually change my life and change my situation and change my season. And she made up in her mind that I ain't got nothing to lose. I ain't got nothing to lose. So even though I was taking a guy, it was pretty funny. This is his first, first, first ministry event. And uh, they were doing a prayer at the pole, and I took Dell because, you know, we hired him to do youth stuff, and it was a killing for an uh, elementary kid at Pine Hills Elementary. This was the third one that they lost. And uh, one of the pastors that was leading says, all right, I'm going to have all y'all pray. And Dale, and the guy said, hey, Pastor Dale. He said, oh, shoot, I ain't no pastor. <laughs> he said, well, pa Pastor Dale, we're going to have you, we're going to have you pray. He said, no, nah, PD, I'm just here to support you, bro. I'm going to be in the back. But, but here's, the, here's the cool thing. Even though she didn't know how to worship like the church, something in her, something in her. Okay, let me, let me help you understand. Your spirit, soul, and body. You missed it. Your spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, when you die, your spirit's going back to God. Because that's the part of you that is God. It's the breath God breathed in you. So when you and I worship, our spirits remember what it was like in eternity. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, Be before you were born, you already were with God. Before, I, before your mama knew you, I knew you. Before you were even formed in your mother's womb, you were with me. The only reason why you were born at the time that you were born is that's when I released you from my heavens and sent you to the earth. But your body and your mind know what it's like to be in the presence of God. You know what it's like when you walk in a room and you're like, I feel something. I don't know what it is. I don't know what I feel. But it's something about when I come to church. I can go to a basketball game and they could be shouting and clapping their hands. I don't feel nothing. I could be with somebody and they're playing the right music and I can feel something. But it ain't nothing like being in the house of God and being in the presence of God and you feel something. I don't know what it is. I can't explain it. Well, let me give you language to what you can't articulate. Your spirit remembers when it was with God and when it sat around the throne of God. That's why your spirit needs to be refilled. It needs to be refueled and that's why when you worship God you feel like you're in a space where it's only you and God because that's what they do in the heavens they, they worship God and then Jesus breaks it down and says they that worship me can only worship me in spirit and in truth because there's a part of you that even though you're from the streets or for the streets it recognizes what it's like to be in the presence of a holy God I can take a thug off the street, put him in the sanctuary. He gonna look around and be like, bro, I don't know what's going on in this place, but I feel something. I don't know what they doing up in there, but I feel something. I don't, I don't even know what's happening. I don't even know how to articulate what's happening, but something within me starts telling me this seems familiar. This, this, this sounds familiar. Even if you were drunk last night and then you're in the presence of God, you feel like something is familiar. That's why every time you're in the presence of God, a part of you is saying you don't deserve to be here and a part of you is saying, no, I need to be here. A part of you is saying, I shouldn't be here and another part of you is saying, oh, I remember what it's like. I don't know how it is, but I, I vaguely remember a part of me referencing this experience and she begins to weep at his feet now when she's weeping at his feet she's washing his dirty feet with her tears because worship is ugly because it's personal. You know, everybody can praise God, but worship is personal. It's when I remember what you've done for me. It's not just remembering what you've done, it's just remembering who you are. No, things and people change, but you you don't ever change. You you stay the same. You you remain the same yesterday, today, and forever. I I don't worship you because of what you do. I worship you because of who. I'm not thanking you because you gave me a new car. That's what praise is. I'm not thanking you because you gave me a new house. That's what praise is. I'm not thanking you because this week is a good week. I'm worshiping you because even when I didn't know, you were still good. Even when I didn't feel it, you were still good. Even when I woke up and didn't even acknowledge you, you were still good. Even when I said to myself, I ain't going to church. I'm just going to do my thing. It's Sunday. It's basketball season. It's football. I'll pick up God when I'm ready. And you still were there and you were like, I was waiting for you, player. I was waiting on you. I was waiting for you to get to yourself and come to me. I'm not going to bring up your past. I'm not going to talk about how many men you've been with. I'm not going to talk about how many people you slept with. I'm just glad that you're at my feet. I'm just glad you're at my presence. And some of you ain't used to someone being that real. And so you reject God because of all of your insecurities. And God is sitting there saying, like, I just want to love you because that's who I am. That's, that's who I am. And there are times where it doesn't always go the way you want. But 
worship. Now, here's the thing, y'all. Y'all sit down. We're just talking. We got eight minutes to finish talking because I got to get y'all back on Wednesday at 645. So here's the thing. I haven't looked at my notes yet. Here's the thing. She was worshiping without evidence. I'm going to go to another church, I'm telling you. She was worshiping without evidence. Kevin, no, no, no. She was worshiping without evidence. He never resurrected from the grave. No, no, no. He didn't hang on a cross before she did this. She did this without any proof of anything that he had the capacity to do. Y'all still missed it. She didn't wait until he resurrected on the third day because worship isn't about what you do. It's about who you are. And even if you don't do another thing, you're still God. Even if you don't move another mountain, you're still the Lord. Even if you don't open another door for your boy, you're still God. Even if you don't give me another year to live, you're still God. You've been good enough. You've been great enough. You've been merciful enough. If you don't do another thing for me, you've been awesome all by yourself. Worship is not what you do when I want it. Worship is I'm giving it to you because even if you don't do it, I know you're capable. Even if you don't heal me, I know you're able. Even if it doesn't turn the way that I think it should, I still know. Okay. All right. I got to close. Y'all, y'all give me something. Here, here's, 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 here's what I'm going to tell you. Because I feel, and I ain't even looked at my notes yet. Not one. Here's what I want to tell you, because I feel this on this side. Some of you sitting there saying, well, well, if he could, why wouldn't he? I mean, that's what a logical, degreed, intellectual thinker, cognitive ability would tell you, well, why wouldn't he? You know, this conversation is a conversation I'll remember until I go to heaven. It was a conversation I had with my mom, who's a super prayer warrior. Like, super is not even the word. Like, she's always praying. She's always praying. But if you, if you know anything about me a little bit, like, you know I have a brother and a sister. My sister is... You know, sometimes she's good, sometimes she's not. Sometimes she's on, on the drug world, and sometimes she's not, whatever. So, um, one day, I was having a conversation, Zeke, find me somewhere. I was having a conversation with my mom, which, in my, in my estimation, my mom is super, superhero spirituality. You don't get any higher than her. This is my estimation, right? I'm sure you feel that way about Maybe your big mama or maybe your mama or whatever, or someone else. But one day we were having a conversation. And uh, I said, uh, Mom, I got a question about something. And she was saying to me, um, you know, son, life in faith is, is not, life in faith, look at your phone. I said, life and faith is not always the way you think. And I'm like, yeah, Ma, I, I, yeah, I hear it. She said, baby, I, you know, some days I do wonder why a person like me who's prayed to God every single morning for at least an hour a day on Saturday for four hours, now, I ain't talking about the prayers that we have where you got a praise team singing. It's just a bunch of old ladies who can't sing that get together and they read the psalms and they just pray for four hours. She said, I've been doing this for 30 years plus. There are times I wonder, God, will you let me live and see the turnaround of my daughter? I, I, 
I turn, and sometimes I wonder if I should even continue. I'm thinking to myself, whoa, I remember I was on Colonial passing by the Meister car wash. And she said, but David, when I sit and think things over, the Lord gives and the Lord takes. I have come to the resolve that even if I got mad and left God because of my experiences with Him, where else am I going to go? Surely you can live your life as an atheist. But it's hard to live your life as an atheist because you got too much proof. It's hard to live your life as an atheist when you've seen God do too many things in your life. And when my mom starts listing all the things, I wasn't a college educated person. I came to the country with no money, no resources, knowing nobody, and was able to raise two and three kids and raise neighborhood kids and able to buy multiple houses in a place that I didn't know as my homeland. And God, even though I've been sick in my body, God has still given me peace. I've outlived my enemies. The enemies that thought they were going to kill me, I've seen them die in my presence. And God has allowed me to outlive them. Now, where am I going to go? Now I got to ask you the same question. Now after you've done all your complaining and after you've done all your upsetness and after you've done all your stuff, you and I have to still ask this same question, this same account. Worship is, I'm going to my text next week, is when you go to God and you ask God and say, God, I want to know why have you forsaken me? And then God gives you his back. And then you say on the cross, nevertheless, not my will but thine will. Worship is not when God says yes. Worship is when even God turns his back and you still sit there and say, I gotta trust you. I don't know how this is gonna work out, but I gotta trust you. I ain't seen it done before, but I gotta trust you. Worship is not, God, I know you're gonna do it. I'm gonna see you do it. Worship is God, you're the God that sits high and looks low. You own a cattle upon a thousand hills. You're not being worshiped for what you do. You're being worshiped because of who you are. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Even if they wanna confess it, they're gonna confess that you are Lord and that you are God. Even cancer will bow, even lupus will bow, even diabetes will, they all will bow as the woman did and they all will say, there is no one like our God. There's no one like Jehovah. There's no one beside him. There's no one like him. gotta go y'all I heard some of you saying this though because you know you'll say stuff like with your cognitive educated self I get it I would say the same thing you say well that's unfair to your mom but you know what's interesting every time I talk to my sister she'll say Dave you know God be looking out for me you, Dave I see God speaking to me and she'll get in some crazy situation. I'm like, how did you get in there? She said, yeah, I got myself in it. But if God wasn't there, I would have been dead. So even though you're sitting there trying to figure out how it's fair to God, God is having his own relationship with his daughter and trying to show her things that you and I would not know because God has a way of dealing with us in the way that only we can understand. So I want to tell you, Life may not always feel good, but worship is always good for you. When you lift your hands, it's like a sign of surrender. It's not my skill, it's not my articulation, it's not my abilities, it's, it's only what you can do. It's, 
God, I, I'm, I'm coming to you not because, I, not because I'm not able, but because you're able. I'm, I worship you not because it's going to happen. I know that you have the power to make it happen. I, I worship you because if I keep worshiping you eventually, if I worship you right, you'll end up responding to me in the way that I need it. And, and God, I'm not looking for that. I'm doing that because I love you. And oftentimes when I do it right and I do it with my heart, you end up giving me what I already wanted even though I didn't know that's what I wanted. Because at the end of the text, the text says this. He says, who's the person that's going to get forgiven and appreciate forgiveness most? Is it going to be the person that just got forgiven for $5 or the person that got forgiven for 500 What he's simply trying to show is that the death of worship, D-E-P-T-H, is determined by what you've been brought out of. Sometimes God puts you in a big hole so that when you come out, your worship and praise matches the hole you were in. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Sometimes God puts you in a big hole so that your praise and worship matches what you came out of. See, when God brings you out, you don't care about what the Pharisees say. You don't care about what other people think about. You don't take all that. You weren't there. Why are you doing all that? It don't take all that. You weren't there. No, 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 no. No, why, why, are, you, why are you always crying when you had, you weren't there? Why are you all, you, you weren't there when I walked across the stage with all these student loans and God forgave them. You weren't there. You, you weren't there when I was living in my car and God gave me a home. You weren't there. You weren't there when I closed on my house when, when everybody said you shouldn't be able to. You weren't there. I just want you to sit there and say, you weren't there. I don't got to explain it to you. I don't got to give you an explanation. I don't even got to tell you, you, you weren't there. You, it wasn't a conference call. It was a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You weren't there. You don't understand why I do what I do because you weren't there. You weren't there. You, you weren't there. It was only me and God. And as much as you think you know me, you weren't there. As much as you feel like we got it going on, you weren't there. When I was at my lowest, you weren't there. When I was on the bottom, you weren't there. Only God was there. And all worship is, is you saying to God, I got the check. It's just you simply saying to God, I got the check. After all you've done for me, I got the check. After all I've seen you bring me out of, I got the check. After, after all you've done when I didn't deserve it, I got the check, God. You ain't got to do another thing. I, I got the check. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm in anticipation of paying it because I know what you did. I saw how you paid it for me. I've, I've, got, I've got the check. Now, real quick, y'all two minutes so you might be one that's like yo I don't I don't understand I ain't grew up in church I'm from the streets I don't know what worship is worship is real simple it's just the acknowledgement by the lifting your hands it's a symbol that I'm nothing and I surrender that all of my intellect stops at this point And then sometimes you may even change your posture and say, God, I, I got to get so low so that I don't stand in the way of myself. Because I don't bow to everything, but I do bow to a holy king. And I just want you to know that, that that's the posture. It's, it's the posture. It may be the lifting of the hands. It may be the bowing of the knee. But it is also what comes out of your mouth. It's the saying that, God, you know how you used to say to somebody you love them and you really didn't even know who they were? It's just saying that I'm replacing that which I used to say I love to something that I really do love. And it's telling them that, God, you know what? I want you to know I love you. 
No, 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 I really love you. I really, really, really love you. I really appreciate you. I really value you. I really care about you. Thank you for caring for me. It's just speaking well of God. So why don't you just take, now that you've been trained, now that you've been deputized, now all you need to do is do it in your own way because God responds to the authentic you, not the one that we created. So God responds to the authentic you. So why don't you just take 60 seconds and just begin to worship the God that created you. Come on, lift those hands. Come on, lift those hands. That's what worship is. Brother, you ain't gonna get more money without learning how to honor God, and even if you do, you're gonna miss God in it. It may feel strange, but it feels strange until it becomes normal. Come on, lift those hands up to the Father. Come on, open your mouth and say something. Father, you're good, 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 you're good. You're good, you're good, no singing, you're good, you're good, you're good, come on, come on man of God, I know it takes a little courage, come on woman of God, I know it's different, but it's good for you, it's good for you, it's, it's healing for you, it's healing for you, it's healing for you, it's healing, it's healing, it's where you cast all your cares before the Lord, you lay down all your burdens before God, and you say, Father, I need you, I love you. I honor you. I magnify you. you. You're the source of my life. You're the source of my strength. You're the lifter of my head. You're the keeper of my life. I thank you for all that you've done. I thank you for all that you're doing. I lay down my hair. I lay down my glory. I lay down my power. I lay down my influence. And I say, Lord, only you. Oh, only you. You are God and you are God by yourself. You are God. You're, you're so much God. The, the heavens declare. The earth declares that you are God. You are, you are God by yourself. The angels declare that you are God. You, you sit high and you look low. You are God. You are God. You are God. You are God from the beginning to the end. You are God. You know everything that I have, everything that I desire, everything that I need. You are God from the foundations of the earth. You are God. You are amazing. 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 You are, amazing. You are an amazing. For the doors that you're opening, your God, you you allowed me to walk away from things that I love, and I found a deeper peace that I never knew. You are God. You are amazing. I want to thank you for my life. I want to thank you for my health. I want to thank you for the strength that you give, God. Even though the weapons that are being formed against me, they are not prospering. You are causing them to be confused. And Lord, I thank you that you're letting me discern the tables that I'm at. You're letting me see the tables that I belong in and you're allowing me to understand what is really happening even when I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Come on. That's the peace of God that he responds to those that worship him. Come on, that's the peace you feel. That's the spirit your spirit remembers. Yeah, it remembers. 
Come on. Your spirit remembers what it feels like to be in this atmosphere. Come on. Let your spirit feel it. Come on. Let your spirit touch. Yeah, let your spirit touch. Let your spirit touch. Let your spirit touch. Sixty seconds. You, you see them tears falling. You ain't playing the tear up. It's cause you're in the presence of God. Your mind can't comprehend how it is to be in this presence. Your soul can't comprehend what it is to be in the pure presence of God. Faulty and all, He still receives you. Messed up and all, He still wants you. He still desires you. Nobody can do this but you. Nobody can do it but you. Nobody can do it but you. Nobody can hear God speak to them on your behalf. What's happening here? God responded. God responded. He responds. He responds. He responds. Some of you are like, man, I'm tired of crying. You can never get tired of crying before God. You're not a nuisance to him. You're his child. You're not a burden to him. You're his own. You're not a problem that needs to be solved. Yes, Lord. 60 seconds. Thank you. 
here for you. He's here for you. He's here for you. Like he's here for you, like for you, for you, for you, and for you. He's here for me. He's here for you. So, Father, I know that there's going to be a greater deposit on even what you're going to do this week. Like we're creating an environment so that God can do what he can do. And we want to create an environment where God even on this Wednesday, we want to create an environment this Wednesday like this where God can just sit on us. Because the greatest level of peace is not going to come when you achieve something. It's going to come from within. And it's only in these environments that we create that peace. So because time constraints, like, I want to create the same environment for us on Wednesday. Like this is what I was really talking about. The greatest gift that I can give to you is to give you an environment to where you can produce everything that God has put in your heart. And that's what we're trying to create. God bless your covenant. And may God bless you both. May your latter days be greater than your former. As the priest that covers the queen, may the oil of God pour on your heart and on your life forever and ever. Yeah. 
this is what we call a house for the hungry. When you're hungry for God, you'll be filled. I'm trying to tell you, God can fill you with J's on or dressed up. He can fill you if you're for the streets or for the church. He just wants your yes and your appetite because he'll never walk out on you. Never, never, never. Y'all, can we give the Lord a shout of praise in this place? Woo! Come on. No, I'm, all right, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's like, like I know y'all used to this at church, but this don't happen every single where or every single place. But can we give, like, let me help coach you through, like, like how excited you are when your team scores or how excited you are as your daughter crosses over or how excited you are as you get that bonus or when something great happens, you, you stand with jubilation and excitement in your heart. Can you, on the count of three, give God that same level of passionate praise and thanksgiving unto God that he as quickly as possible. We gotta do our giving so you can go home. Ushers, if you need an envelope, Ushers coming to you right now for you to give. Listen, in this environment, you can't rob God, y'all. Like, I don't know if you're online, if you feel it in your home like we feel it in the sanctuary, but ugh, every person Let's honor God with what we have. I don't know if you feel it like we feel it here online, but I hope you do. I know some of y'all had an issue online. Like, but this, imagine what it's going to be like this Wednesday when we all come with the mindset like, we're here to create heaven on earth. Like, we're here to create heaven on earth. Like, we're going to do it. of this Pastor Jones is going to come up once we've given we'll have on the screens at the end if you want to give a birthday gift we greatly receive it but before we do that like yo y'all got to give first to the house of God ultimately because this is what we are called to do like we honor God first we honor what God does and there's nothing wrong with celebrating a gift that God has given to you in the person of a leader. But ultimately, you honor God first. So let's do that. Let's honor the Lord in our tithe, our offering. Like, I would be scared not to give to God in this moment. Not scared because I think he's going to harm me. But because I know how good he's been in this moment. And like, we can't manufacture this but God has to sit on it. Like what is 10% to a God that's blessed you with 90 and your 90 is far more blessed than most people who are making 100%. So let's honor him, even if you're online. Let's do it. If you need an envelope, ushers are coming to you. If you need an envelope, raise your hand, they're coming to you. If they miss you, they're coming to you right now. Let's pray over them. Pastor Jones will close us out. I'm going to receive too. But let's pray over our giving. 
Y'all, seriously, I need you to do me a favor too. Not only be here this Wednesday, I need you to invite someone who's missing this Wednesday. I want them, I want everybody to create this atmosphere. Like, I want like God to sit in this room. I'm telling you, all of my dreams have come from a worship experience. A lot of them, not all, but a lot of them. All the people you need in this moment. So Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. We're going to be here at 645. Let's jam up all parking lots at 645. Straight from work, this ain't, we ain't going to hold you till 12 o'clock at night. And if the speaker's long, we're going to be like, listen, you need to hurry up because we, we, got, we got places to go. <laughs> so let's be here. Let's do it. Let's pray. I give it online. Let's, let's do it. Let's pray it together. Is that cool? I was preaching to him when I was 16 years old. Now seeing him on the side of the building. So cool. He was a member before his brother. We have to remind him, you were a member here first. <laughs> Let's pray over our giving, y'all. Father, thank you again. Wow, thank you. Thank you is not enough. We got the check. In this moment, we got the check. We get to give it back to you because you've been so good to us. Thank you for that. I can't repay you for your goodness, but God, I give you a small portion through my giving that shows that I'm spiritually mature and I have spiritual discipline financially to honor you. So Lord, bless what I've given. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.